Thank you so much. Uh, good morning to everyone. It's a great pleasure to be here today telling you a little bit about echocardiography in rats and specifically focusing on assessing diastolic function. And Serena, I thank you again for the invitation. Uh, I'm very pleased to be here. And yesterday, while I was coming back to Trieste, which is my first time, uh, I had to take, it took me a while, I had to take three flights, but I, I finally landed on Rome on Leonardo da Vinci Airport. And of course, I had to remember this great guy, he's Italian, and he, he contributes so much with so much amount of knowledge to what we now know about cardio, uh, anatomy of the heart, and it's also a little bit about its function. And he did it in the 16th century. This guy, guy was a genius. He was the one first doing the first drawings of uh, the coronary arteries. He told us about how the heart has four cavities and it contracts asynchronously. He also described the, the structure and the dynamic of the valves. He showed us a little bit about also the blood flow and he told us about the eddy currents and many other things like the heart has several ways, uh, several fibers in different directions and it contracts asynchronously. So imagine if this guy had had a vivo on his time. Imagine the amount of knowledge he could have delivered to us in terms of cardiac anatomy and structure. And now later on, unfortunately, I have to disclose now that I don't have a vivo in my lab, which is actually a pity, and I'm not a cardiologist, so I will speak mostly about assessing diastolic function in rats. And why is that? You will understand that one of the major focus of our lab is heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. And yesterday, uh, one of the speakers, Sander, made me uh, the, the, great, the favor to explain you a little bit about diastolic dysfunction and heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. So I will first start, uh, start to tell you briefly what is diastolic function, how can we assess this, assess this using echocardiography, the criteria for diastolic dysfunction and heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. Of course, so far, this is only uh, uh, described and defined for humans, not for rats, and that's why we need four standards. Uh, the technique how to assess cardiac function, particularly focus on diastolic function, and then I will provide you two studies that came from, from our lab. One is an example of an animal model of heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. Part of the problem of not having a good therapy for this syndrome is because we don't have a robust animal model of heart failure, or at least we didn't have up to that point. Now I, I like to believe that, that we give a good contribute to that part of science. And then I will provide you with a surrogate of end diastolic pressure, which is an invasive way to assess diastolic function, dysfunction, and so how can we do it with echocardiography in a very reliable way. And then of course I'll conclude. So to start with, at this time you already know what is diastolic. Uh, function and diastole is major, it's mostly comprised by four phases. Diastolometric relaxation time, that sets the beginning of the diastole. And then we have, of course, an early filling of the ventricle because we have this big gradient between the left atria and left ventricle. And then, of course, nothing does, we have a third period that nothing really happens between the atria and the ventricle because the pressures are almost the same. And then finally, the atria contracts and pushes the final part of blood inside the ventricle. And that finishes mostly diastole. Uh, then, of course, we start with isovolumetric contraction, and we are already on the systolic part. So, how can we assess this? We can do the transmittal flow by measuring the, the blood flow going through the inflow on the ventricle, through the mitral valve. We can assess by the ENDA. We can do myocardial tissue Doppler to assess myocardial veloc velocities during diastole. And of course, the velocities itself do not have that much amount, do not deliver that much amount of information. But if we combine this ratio, which had been previously, over, almost 20 years ago, described as being a good indication of the left ventricle filling pressure. So if we divide the early filling with the myocardial uh, velocity during early filling, then we have E2E prime, which is a good indicator of myocardial stiffness. We can also assess my left atrium area. It's to do a trace in echo, I will explain it later. And then isovolumetric relaxation time, which of course is an important part of diastole. And if we want to see if it's prolonged or decreased, that will might give us an idea how uh, the relaxation of the heart is. 
And lately, and lastly, the peak reverse longitudinal strain rates that can be assessed by speckle tracking. We don't do it because we don't have machine to, to do that. So how should I start? And this will be, the beginning of this session will be very practical. Uh, you all have an idea, but I, I try to be very step-by-step -step and like provide you a checklist how to do echocardiography. You will start to anesthetize the animal, and usually allogenated gases are the ones that are preferred because they are very reversible. You can try to take them very well and increase or decrease heart rate, and they are uh, the least cardiodepressant and aesthetic, so they are usually the ones that most people use. And you would start by using a, a percentage a slightly uh, higher than what then you need, mixed with oxygen, and then you place a nose cone on the animal and you reduce a little bit the, the percentage of the anesthesia. And then, of course, you shave and apply the depilatory cream from the neckline to the mid-chest level. And then you have to have some, some sort of attention because females have nipples, so if you go with the machine, it will be a disgrace. And after all, the cream, it's also a little bit sensitive to the mice and rat skin, so you have to put it and take it as soon as the fear is up. Apply lubricant eye gel to avoid any eye damage, if you can and then start the echocardiograph and adjust, adjust all the settings that you'll need. Reduce the ambient light, always helps to have a dark room. And place the animal on a heating pad and place the ECG electrodes. And for the installic uh, function assessment, the ECG is particularly useful. So monitor heart rate and body temperature. A slight difference in body temperature might uh, have an impact on cardiac function. And then apply the echo gel and position the animal as you wish. In the case of vivo, you don't have to be positioned one or twice and it will be fine. So avoid chest compression with the echo probe, which is actually not a problem also with the vivo. <coughs> so to start with, the transmittal flow, we all have heard about E to A uh, ratio. It's, we can assess this by using pulsed wave Doppler in the four apical chamber view, <laughs> like putting the the probe like this, and then you see this view of the atria, atria and the ventricles. And then if you put the sample volume here, you can see the blood flow going through the mitral valve or through the tricuspid valve. And if you put color Doppler, it will help to see the flow. And as continuous as it is, it's better because then you can really assess E and A waves. Um, so, uh, sample volume is placed just next to the tips of the leaflets of the mitral valve, or if you want to try to assess uh, a right ventricular function, you can also do it on the tricuspid valve. Uh, so, you have your representation of what you will see. This is, to be honest, this is, I doubt that this is from rat, this is probably from humans, because you have a clear separation from the E and A, and because rats have high uh, heart rate, you barely see this nice separation. You see it, for instance, in humans. In mice, it's almost impossible. You see E and A almost like if it was just one peak. So, what to do? There are people, and you see papers that describe they increase the anesthesia to decrease heart rate, but that's not physiological, and we avoid doing that as much as we can. So, we try to keep the heart rates as physiological as possible, and then we try to see if we see the E and A wave, and if we don't, just leave it like that. In the end of the exam, we increase a little bit the anesthesia when we took already all the other parameters and try to separate the waves, even though you have to be careful while analyzing this data. Otherwise, A is not that important, as you will see. So as long as you have the highest peak and it will be the A uh, wave, you'll be fine. So other thing that I tried to do with my presentation was really to provide what are our reference values. And I have to, again, to disclose that this is the, our own experience. It's not the standards. This needs to be discussed with other labs and with other people doing echocardiography with different machines, because this is highly dependent on the lab, on the machine, whatever. So this is what we would, the interval of normal values, at least in our own experience. And I'm talking about rats between 200 and 400 grams. Again, how to assess E and A, and to separate E and A, we need a standard for that. Myocardial tissue Doppler. It's a very <coughs> noisy, no, it's a, a noisier signal, so here it's really important to have a clear ECG tracing. Um, and again, I'm sorry, just to tell, here you can see the myocardial velocities, 
if you move the, the probe, the, the sample volume, a little bit to the side, and you place it on the interventricular septum, you can clearly see this sign off, and then you change for tissue doctor imaging on the four chamber view, again, the same projection as we had here, uh, and then you start to see the myocardial velocities. You have the S co corresponding to the systolic myocardial uh, movement, and then you have the E and the A corresponding to the early filling and late filling of the ventricle, and here you can also assess isovolumic relaxation time and isovolumic contraction time. And I didn't mention here, but it's easier usually to do it with the um, post-wave Doppler on the transmittal flow. So it's much easier to take these values, the, the EVCT, EVRT, and then the ejection time, and then the, the acceleration time of the E wave. And we'll see later on how this was, at least in our experience, important for us. Here you can do it as well, but as you can see, the, the, the signal is much noisier. So again, this is what we consider for us the normal values, and this is the projection that you'll have. You'll place the, pro, the sample volume here, and usually there are some other people who try to do it in the free wall. Of course, here you'll have much higher velocities because the free wall moves much faster than, or a little bit faster than the interventricular septum. And this, of course, I told you, it has been described. If I normalize the E assessed in the previous slide with early myocardial filling velocities, and I normalize this E to E prime or E to A, the EA, uh, I have a good correlation with end diastolic pressure. And this is like the gold standard to see if we have increased stiffness of the myocardium. So this was already described in 2002. And since then, many other uh, laboratories, and including ourselves, have tried to provide new surrogates of end diastolic pressure. So we can also do the left atrium area. It has like this shape. Um, you can do it on the four chamber view, epical four chamber view. You trace it in the B mode, and you are able to calculate the area of the atrial. You can also try to, if you are lucky and you have a good resolution, you can also do it with the right atrium if you are focusing more, of course, in pathologies related with the right side of the heart. The normal values for us and isovolumic relaxation type, which is usually increased in diastolic, with diastolic dysfunction, and peak reversal longitudinal strain rate. I will skip this because I don't have experience in taking these values. The, the TE index of my, or myocardial performance index, it's not really a, a diastolic parameter, it's a global function uh, of the myocardium. And you can also assess it, like assuming that I, the, the isovolumic periods of the cardiac cycle, uh, they spend energy. So in heart failure, these are the ones that are mostly affected. And so if they are affected, they will increase the upper part of the equation, and we have a prolonged TE index. But again, I have to stress out that this is not a diastolic function. It uses some parameters of diastolic function, but it's an overall myocardial function assessment. So, how, uh, a summary of the parameters to apply. And this slide will be confused in the end, but I try to include how, di how can you assess diastolic function when you are doing a normal uh, assessment of systolic and diastolic parameters. So going to the parasternal long axis, which is this, this projection, and you see here the, in the B mode what you can see slightly oscillating, tilting the probe between one and another projection. You can take all these parameters, which I will let you know then what are the ones that are mostly related with diastolic function. Assure that the longer axis is measured. So try to change the probe to be sure that the long axis is really being measured. So if you rotate the probe 90 degrees, 90 degrees, you will be seeing the short external short axis. And you can place the probe at the level of the aortic valve, left ventricular outflow trap, and here you can uh, measure the VTI, and then if you multiply it by the, um, the dimensions of the aorta, you will have the stroke volume. You can also assess the M mode, which most people do at the level of the papillary muscles, just above the papillary muscles, and you can take the M mode and you take all the dimensions that usually are used in, in, in the uh, papers describing systolic function. And most of the 
leverage or in stock here. They focus really on this part. Then if you go to ethical five chamber view, which is very unlike the four chamber view, but then you see the aorta, you can take the uh, VTI of the aorta and combined with the dimensions, you can take stroke volume. If you multiply stroke volume by heart rate, you'll have cardiac output. And if you divide it by the body weight or body surface area, you'll have the cardiac index. And finally, the apical four chamber view, it's the one where you take most of the parameters related to diastolic function. This is uh, myocardial tissue Doppler. This is the projection that you will see. And then you take all these parameters. You also take taps if you are looking at the right ventricle from this projection, all the, the times and the myocardial velocities. And you have to ensure to visualize, uh, visualize the mitral and tricuspid valves full opening and closing at and the atria. This is the perfect uh, way to do all these measurements. Sometimes you see mostly the atria and sometimes you see mostly the flow. It's sometimes impossible to see both things at the same time. So, to summarize, because there's a lot of information here, if you want to assess systolic function, this is what you have to see. If you want to assess diastolic function, the green sinus parameters are the ones that you have to take. And as I told you, the four chamber view is the most informative one regarding taking parameters of diastolic function. If you want to look at the right ventricle, this is what you have to pay attention to. And finally, if you are looking to a sort of a pathology that is related with valves, then this is what you should pay attention. So I put it all together and I try to include the diastolic parameters in a normal echo. We don't pay too much attention to, for instance, the valves because we are not expecting to have any valve uh, alterations, but the other parts, the blue, the green and the yellow, usually take this. Okay, checklist. To finalize the exam, assess always the heart rate. That will be crucial. Acquire three good measurements for each parameter. Record videos for subsequent analysis, especially if you are willing to trace some borders or some limits. The videos might really be helpful. And then set the sample volume at its smallest size, especially when we are working with such small animals. So, remove the electrode gel. Allow the animal to recover from the anesthesia and afterwards place it on the cage. Just pay attention to his mates because they like to smell all over him, so it should be awake. Check the reflexes, close the anesthesia and the O2, and then check all the energies that you took and make sure that you took all the parameters uh, before having to anesthetize the animal again. So when doing the analysis, perform an analysis blinded for the observer. This would be the ideal. Uh, average three reliable measurements. So you have to assess three things and then average them. Mm -hmm. Normalize time parameters for cycle duration in case heart rate dif is different between groups. So if you have a group with a very high or very low uh, heart rate, then try to normalize to the duration of the cardiac cycle, especially parameters derived from time. Then if the animals have very different weight between groups, also try to normalize the, the volumes and the dimensions to, to body surface area, which we calculate for rats by this, using this formula. Assessing diastolic function and going back to a little bit of what we know about humans. The most common measurements of diastolic function will provide you this overview. We don't use the VP, not even the pulse venous flow, the pulmonary venous flow. Uh, but the criteria are very well defined for humans, and you have four stages of diastolic dysfunction. The normal, the impaired relaxation, pseudo-normal, uh, and restricted feeling. Mostly you see the A wave getting higher in the beginning, um, because the, the, the ventricle is, is getting stiffer, and so the atria will contribute more for feeling the heart. But then you have this pseudo-normalization that it seems like it goes back to normal, but if you look to myocardial velocities and E2E E prime, it's getting higher because myocardial velocity is getting slower. So this is very well described for humans, and this is what we, should, we would, would be willing to have for rats and mice as well. And we need to standardize this as well to see exactly what we are seeing and which stage of diastolic dysfunction we are observing. And there has been an attempt, the previous, uh, the, uh, one of the speakers of yesterday uh, also mentioned this graph and it is indeed innovative and 
great to have this proposal. As soon this was made for mice, as soon as you have an increased left atrial area, you can manage that you have diastolic dysfunction in mice. And then you should see how much this dysfunction is aggravated by using isovolumetric relaxation time and the longi reverse longitudinal strain rate. So, the other part of the talk. Why did, in our own experience, we need to have such a good characterization of diastolic dysfunction? That was because in 2010, we were asked to deliver, we have been working in FF for quite a while time, and we're fortunate to have biopsies, uh, but it got to a point that we really needed to go to the animal model, and we were asked and we were challenged to propose a good animal model for heart failure with preserved ejection <coughs> fraction. And the idea at the time was to try to get to a sort of a rat that would have all the comorbidities that we usually see in heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. And usually this population of heart failure patients are either diabetic or obese or hypertensive or they are old or they are female. So we try to, we know this is important, we know that HEP prevalence is around half of heart failure patients. Uh, in opposite to what we have in uh, heart failure with reduced ejection fraction where it's always below 40%, uh, the pathophysiology is quite well described, it's phenotype as well, and the therapeutic options are getting there, are really quite effective. The other, it, but this doesn't happen for heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. We know some of its pathophysiology, but we haven't been able to deliver proper therapeutic strategies to treat these patients, and this is mostly because of the population heterogeneity, they are old, diabetic, non-diabetic, hypertensive, and so on. And it's getting higher because all of those comorbidities are also getting higher. And there are not really any good therapeutic option that was able to change the course of the disease. So this is an issue. We, we thought at the time that if we had a good animal model, it could help. So uh, also the description is very well stated. Uh, this was done by Paulus in 2007. Uh, you, the patients had to have signs and symptoms of heart failure. They should clearly have preserved ejection fraction above 50% and uh, the ventricle should have a normal or not a dilated shape. And then we should check for diastolic dysfunction. And this means that uh, filling pressures assessed by E2E prime will be high or you will have uh, pulmonary wedge capillary pressures above 15 or and diastolic pressure above 12 millimeters of mercury. Of course, these are invasive measurements and not always able to be performed. So the echo E2E prime is still the best option to see if they have diastolic dysfunction. If my uh, filling pressures or this value is not that high, then we have to combine it with one of these options. And then if they have this and another one of this one, we can state that that patient has heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. So again, this is very well stated for, for and defined for humans. I wouldn't say very well because there are changes between Europe and America and it's not a clear thing so far. Uh, but some, some, something is that many times it's not possible to see none of this while the patient is resting. And so there have been people who have proposed like, like they should have uh, a sort of a ex exercise intolerance and this would be enough to um, give a diagnosis for these patients in an earlier stage. So we wanted to really to come up because we knew this heart failure with preserved ejection fraction was so prevalent. There is not really a good, um, a good therapeutic option. We know that uh, these patients have or impaired relaxation or increased stiffness, and that was what we were aiming to see in the animal model. So I told you all of that. This we didn't have so far a, a feasible and well characterized of animal of FPF. And so the goal was really to characterize it in terms of cardiac and vascular function structure, as well as general metabolic and renal function, because we were dealing with an animal model that has been described as a good metabolic syndrome animal model. And then to include how we can assess the impact of several other risk factors. So this was our experimental design. This obese ZSF1, which we then stated as a good animal model of heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, they are obese, they are diabetic, uh, insulin resistant, and they have hypertension. And we fed them with their normal diets, 
and we fed them with a diet that we named Western diet, rich in salt and in fat content. Then we have a sort of a first control, which is only hypertensive, but it doesn't have all the other metabolic disturbances like diabetes, insulin resistance, and obesity. And we have the pure control, which is Mr. Kyoto, which doesn't have hypertension, none of other uh, risk factors. To be honest, I don't like that much Mr. Kyoto. They, they are strange animals. So I would prefer to compare them with the lean ones, although I know they are, they are hypertensive. Why? They have huge inflammatory levels. They are an animal model of depression and anxiety. So they are very stressed animals. I don't trust that much these, these because they have been inbred so much. So we started at ten, their 10 week of age and every four weeks we would do a serial evaluation of metabolic cages, insulin resistance, glucose tolerance tests, blood sampling, and echocardiography. And then by their 20 week of age, because we were checking with the echo, the progression of the disease, we decided to do a terminal hemodynamic morphometric and sample collection. And this is what we got in terms of morphometry. As expected, and I wouldn't pay, I will tell you right now, I wouldn't pay too much attention to the Western diets one because they are very similar to the normal diet. This phenotype <coughs> was already so much exacerbated that the Western diet did not deteriorated even more the phenotype. So I would assume and I would see this as like an only group. So we have the Wister Kyoto and the, uh, the, both, both the lean had already some degree of hypertrophy because they are hypertensive, they should. And then the obese ones have an additional hypertrophy because of all the comorbidities. They had lung congestion, the obese ones. They had a huge liver a steatotic, uh, ste with uh, hepatic steatosis. They had a sort of uh, cachexia in the skeletal muscle, or the sense by in the skeletal muscle, and they had huge amounts of perirenal fat. These are very nice rats. They are very friendly. They lay down on their cages, eating all the day, so uh, happy. Um, the body weight was always higher in the obese animals compared to the wister and the lean, and their energy intake, assessed by the caloric amount of uh, the calories ingested every day, was always slightly higher in the obese groups. They had hyperlipidemia, as we can see here by the levels of cholesterol and LDL. Uh, they have hyperglycemia, and they had clearly insulin resistant since the beginning up to the end of the protocol. So they had clear metabolic abnormalities. In terms of echocardiography, they had not an inversion, but you can clearly see that the A wave is getting higher, and this is usually the pattern that you see in rats. Um, you never see clearly the separation between E and A. And in terms of myocardial velocities, you could see that uh, early myocardial diastolic velocity was decreasing uh, when we go from the wister to the obese. And of course, E to A, E prime was getting higher due to this decrease. Uh, they were clearly hypertrophic, as I first showed in the morphometry data, and their ejection fraction was preserved as well as cardiac index, showing that this, they didn't have major systolic abnormalities. We also checked with hemodynamics, and here we can clearly see that the lean and the obese have higher uh, blood pressure because they are hypertensive, it's normal. They have preserved ejection fraction, and also cardiac index was normal. They had clearly, sorry, it's a little bit on the side, they had clearly increase uh, arterial elastance and the, um, the systolic part was preserved. They had increased stiffness assessed by end diastolic pressure compared to Wister and Lin. And, when, and also relaxation was impaired as, as assessed by a prolonged tau values. <laughs> and of course the most trustable parameter to assess myocardial stiffness is end diastolic pressure volume relation, which is a parameter completely independent of loading conditions. It was also increased. So, we successfully <coughs> achieved our goal to establish an animal model of FPF by using the ZSF one of these. We characterized this model in the developed science, early science of heart failure with diastolic dysfunction by their 20 weeks of age. We go now up to 30 weeks, but after that, we do not like to go further than that because they start to develop renal dysfunction as well. 
We conclude that dissociation of risk factors, such as obesity, diabetes, is crucial for the development of uh, this phenotype and to promote diastolic dysfunction. Um, what we are now doing is trying to isolate each one of these parameters to see what is the relative contribution of diabetes, obesity, and so on. And we know hypertension by itself, it's not crucial because the limbs are also hypertensive and they do not develop at that. So it is a robust animal model, but up to this point, we had still to prove, and we knew we had to show that we had effort intolerance. And this was our next study. So we did a lot of echocardiography and invasive dynamics during stress testing for assessing heart failure with preserved ejection fractions for three different reasons. First, we wanted to show that they have effort intolerance. Second, we know that the population of FPEF patients is usually old, obese, they do not have a good mobility, and they are not really prone to the exercise testing. So could we provide them an alternative to exercise stress uh, to try to see and exacerbate the phenotype? And lastly, because invasive hemodynamics, uh, we can assess an diastolic pressure, and this is the gold standard to see if myocardial stiffness is not always ethically approved or indicated, then we wanted to provide a surrogate other than E2, E prime, to see if we can have a better correlation with then diastolic pressure. And so these were the three main goals. Effort intolerance, to assess a new way to stress these rats in order to see if, how they respond in terms of end diastolic pressure. And we did it by increasing afterload, preload, and heart rate by using the trembling board positioning, so putting the animal with the head tilt down 30 degrees, dobutamine to increase heart rate, and phenylephrine to increase afterload. And finally, to see if we can come up with a surrogate for an diastolic pressure. So this was the protocol again. By their 17 week of age, we decided to do these crossover studies like perfusing dobutamine, phenylephrine, and Tremblinburg. Of course, we had a period of washout between these three tests. And while doing this infusion or maneuver, we were doing hemodynamic and echocardiography simultaneously. And then one week later, we let the animals to recover and we would do, do exercise protocol with peak effort and then risk capacity. So, I can show you what we did. We put a, a PV catheter inside the common right carot uh, carotid artery. We did a pore string suture, and then we progressed with the catheter until the left ventricle. When we finalized, we closed the suture, and, the, and it was safe, and the animal recovered in most of the cases. This is what we could see when we were doing echocardiography. I'm very sorry that you cannot see it here. Uh, but you could see, I'm sorry, this video is not working. You could see the catheter inside. It's very fast. Um, and here you see in the short axis, you can see clearly the catheter inside the left ventricle. In the long axis, it would be nicer to see, but you see there the catheter. So this was what we were doing and seeing by using the echocardiography. So during exercise testing, the obese animals had clearly <coughs> a low performance, a low VO2 max, and this was at peak effort and NRS testing. Then with the tests, we did, this is the phenylephrine infusion, this is the Trendlinburg positioning, and this is the vitamin infusion. And we can clearly see that uh, increasing uh, preload and increasing afterload and preload, we could see that end diastolic pressure was going up. It was already based on increase compared with the uh, lean and the uh, wister cute, but we already knew this. And of course, this, this uh, infusion, this, this maneuver, were able to further increase end diastolic pressure up to a level that they showed effort intolerance. And also tau was able to increase with phenylephrine and trendelenburg, but the vitamin was not able to do this. So if we had to choose, we of course would choose 
turned Lamborg and Fanili Frim to exacerbate this diastolic function uh, abnormalities. So then we went to the echo and to try to see which of these three were able to have the same pattern. And of course, forget about the butamine. We have already seen it would not be a good option. But we tried to assess this E, normalized to deceleration time of E wave, normalized to cardiac cycle F because they had differences in heart rate. And this was clearly going in the same direction as end diastolic pressure, E to E prime again, and left atrium area also going in the same direction. So these were three good candidates and we already know about this one and this one as a good surrogate for end diastolic pressure. So if we correlate this with end diastolic pressure, all of the trees show a good correlation with a slight uh, better correlation when we use this parameter. The advantage of using this when compared to E3' prime is that in a post-wave uh, post Doppler we can assess this parameter without having to go to myocardial tissue Doppler. And if we do a rock curve analysis for the cutoff value of end diastolic pressure around 13 millimeters of mercury, mm -hmm. we could clearly see that the area under curve, the higher area under curve, was to <coughs> e normalized to deceleration time and left atrium area indexed. So, to finalize, ZSFOBs present decreased effort intolerance, VO2 max, and anaerobic thresholds. So. Uh, it's more reliant on anaerobic metabolism, and again, we further confirmed that this was a good animal model of heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. Phenylephrine infusion and trend limbo position, positioning are the best alternatives to exercise training uh, and can be used in, we hope, in patients that do have a reduced mobility to try to uh, give, provide them an, an alternative to exercise testing. This is because, as I told you, many patients fail to meet the diagnostic criteria under resting conditions, and also they have limited um, capacity to do these test tests. And E normalized to the, the, e, the ratio between in and deceleration time normalized to cardiac question and left atria index tend to be better predictors of end diastolic pressure compared to E3 prime. And after that, as I told you, they can be assessed in a just a single acquisition. So, to finalize, I have to go back to what I started with. What are the advantages of echocardiography? You all know by now, at this time of the course, it's a powerful tool for non-invasive evaluation of both cardiac structure and function. It's relatively quickly a method that allows serial assessment. It's not a terminal procedure, um, as many times hemodynamic is. Not, we show that it doesn't have to be, but most of the times it is. And the recent developments in technology and equipment are providing us better tools to precisely assess systolic and diastolic function. The disadvantage is that it's not yet an automated procedure. Let's see if it goes on this direction. It's highly operator dependent and relies on proper acquisition and interpretation of the results. And I would add that it's not highly operated, but it's machine, pathology, laboratory settings, PC and strain dependent. That's why it's difficult to get and to have proper standards. And going back to my own topic of research, why do we need to assess properly diastolic dysfunction using echocardiography? Because we all know that FPEF is increasing, mostly due to all these risk factors that are getting epidemic in our society, obesity, diabetes, and so to have a proper way to, to measure this and assess this will be, of course, a major advantage in trying to treat this patient, characterize and possibly give them a, a therapeutic option. And of course, this is the people I have to thank for all the help. And thank you for your attention.